Propositions, like numbers, are things that you could spend a lifetime studying, and some people do. But I'm going to work on the assumption that you don't have a lot of time for abstract objects, and maybe you're not particularly fond of maths. That being the case, what's the minimum that you need to know about propositions? We're interested because we want to know what we can use to distinguish the contents of mental states. And the thought is that the only real candidate available to us is a proposition. But of course we need to know then what propositions are. Propositions are supposed to have two basic properties. They're things which can be true or false, three actually. Um, the truth value of a proposition is not supposed to change. So if a proposition is true, it's always true. It's not going to change as time goes on. Um, sorry, I should stop here. Steve, what's a truth value? Good question. Glad you asked. Uh, truth value just refers to the true if the proposition is true and the false if the proposition is false. So what we're saying here is that a true proposition is always true, eternally so, and a false proposition likewise. Truth value, useful piece of terminology. Third feature of propositions is that they're abstract objects like numbers. So based on what we were talking about earlier, we can see that propositions are unlike sentences because sentences are not the right kind of thing to be true and false. And propositions are unlike utterances because utterances are not abstract objects. They're events with a date and time, things that make up your life. So here's some basic features of propositions, but you still don't really know what a proposition is. So let me introduce you to some inference patterns which some people, not everybody, but some people take to be interestingly revelatory. So here's one little piece of inference. What Aisha said is true. We don't know what she said, doesn't really matter what she said. Um, what Aisha said is true, but sentences are not the kinds of things that can be true or false. So what Aisha said is not a sentence. That's the first inference. Here's a second complementary inference. What Aisha said is what Steve said. Aisha's utterance is not Steve's utterance. She said one thing at one time, I said something else at a different time. Because utterances are events, difference in time means difference in thing. So it follows from this, of course, that what Aisha said is not an utterance. If it were an utterance, it couldn't be the same thing as my utterance. Given that those two arguments are right, it's quite tempting to think that what Aisha said must be something, but since it can't be either a sentence or an utterance, it must be a proposition. So here's another thought about propositions. Propositions are supposed to be the things that we express in making utterances. Now, I don't think we need to be committed to this. I mention it just because it might help you to uh, feel happy and comfortable, familiar with the idea. But you may want, for various technical reasons, to reject the idea that there is anything that Aisha said. There may be nothing, no thing, which Aisha said. And so no need for propositions in this context. Some people think there are, some people think there aren't. I'm not going to take sides of that, and I don't think that you need to. What you can do, though, is you can think, well, if you do think there is a thing here, then very likely that would be a proposition. Great. So propositions so far are things that can be true or false, and they might be the things that utterances characteristically express. Still don't really know what they are, do we? We still don't really know what they are. Let's try and go a bit deeper. A possible world is just a way that the world is or could be. Many films, other works of fiction, are windows onto possible worlds, ways that the world could be. And some of those, of course, are logically possible worlds, but not physically possible worlds. They're worlds in which the laws of physics differ from ours. So take it the idea of a possible world is a simple building block that we can work with. It's just a way that the world could be. The world could have been, as depicted in the film, your name. It doesn't happen to be, but that is a possible world that the film is giving us a window 
onto. Here's a view. Propositions are simply sets of possible worlds. When you want to ask yourself, well, what does the proposition capture? You just look at what's common to all of the worlds in the set, which is that proposition. So for example, where is it here? Here's the puffin again. Now you can imagine, consider all the, all the possible worlds, which the puffin remains here. I'm gonna put the puffin somewhere. I haven't really got anywhere to put the puffin. Um, there we go. Now you can see the puffin just, just here. So the puffin's gonna remain here. And this is a possible world. I'm here, the puffin's here. There's another possible world in which I'm over here, but the puffin's still there. You imagine all the possible worlds, you keep moving me around, but the puffin stays still. So that set of possible worlds, if you imagine moving everything around apart from the puffin and its location, that set of possible worlds would be the set which represents the proposition which we might express by saying the puffin is here. See how that works? What's common to all of the worlds is just the puffins being here. That's what gives us this set of possible worlds. And that set of possible worlds captures the idea that the puffin is here. So we can think of propositions as possible worlds, and this idea has been worked out in some detail. But it comes with a downside for us. What's the downside? Well, here's a proposition which is true in all possible worlds. It's a mathematical truth, and I think the mathema truths of mathematics are not things that, even as a matter you know, of the broadest possible kind of possibility, could, could be violated. Um, so 2 to the power of 16 is 65,536. It's true in all possible worlds. That being the case, it follows that we can take a proposition like Charlie as a secret agent and construct a second proposition, which is true in the same possible worlds, A and B. Do you see how that works? The possible worlds in which A is true are the same as the possible worlds in B is true in which b is true, because 2 to the power of 16 is 65,536 is true in all possible worlds. Now that's no problem at all. So from the point of view of possible worlds, sorry, from the point of view of propositions being possible worlds, a and b are one and the same proposition. No problem. But we also should observe that Aisha could know a while not knowing b. Maybe she's just not that into binary, so she doesn't happen to know powers of two very well. She's, she's missed that part of her education, um, let's say. But she may well know that Charlie is a secret agent because she's paying good attention to the film The Long Kiss Goodnight. But if propositions are sensible possible worlds, then as I was saying, A and B are not actually distinct. There's only one proposition there. And what that tells us is that propositions as sets of possible worlds don't fully enable us to capture Aisha's point of view. So if we want to use propositions to individuate contents, that's because we want to use propositions to capture points of view, ultimately. And if the propositions fail to do that, then we need something different. What should we do? Well, we could take a different view about the nature of propositions. So let's consider a second view, the view that propositions are sets of objects, properties, and functions. Now, to explain this view, I'm going to take it that the letter S can stand in for the property of being a secret agent. So that's a property that I lack, sadly, uh, but Charlie possesses. I'm also going to use these angle brackets to represent an ordered tuple. A tuple is just a set, uh, but built up in such a way that the order of the elements is preserved in it. Um, so if I have a, a proposition, I would have here, for example, the order tuple containing first of all the property S, followed by Charlie. Um, the things in this tuple are actually the property and Charlie herself. They're actually both members of the set. And the idea is this, that the uh, proposition, in order to be true, has to be the case that Charlie bears that property. Now we might use this proposition to individuate the content of Aisha's belief that Charlie is a secret agent. We can distinguish Aisha's belief from other beliefs that she might have, like the belief that Steve is a secret agent, for example. Very simple idea. Propositions are sets of properties, objects, and functions. Using that, we can get further than we can with the 
idea that propositions are sets of possible worlds. Because then, of course, we can put, as well as Charlie, we can put abstract objects in here like numbers and so on. And we can have the property of, you know, uh, being a square number or whatever it might be. And we can add in the identity relation um, and so on. So we're going to get really good story here about propositions by thinking of them as these sets. So what are propositions? Well, we've seen that there are different kinds of proposition, like there are different kinds of number. There are what I'm going to call Lewisian propositions, they're sets of possible worlds, and there are Russellian propositions, which are sets of objects, properties, and functions. There might be other kinds of propositions besides these two as well. Now, sometimes in philosophy, there are arguments about, well, what, what are the true propositions here? My own take on that is that that's a silly question. That's like saying, well, what are the true numbers here? The set of natural numbers is gives you a perfectly good notion of number, but so does the set of real numbers. And I don't want to say, look, that the only kind of fundamental numbers are the real numbers or something like that. I, I'm very happy with the thought there are all kinds of numbers. There are even imaginary numbers. Um, I'm very happy with the thought there are many different kinds of number, many different systems of number, and they can be used for different ends. Similarly here, there are many different kinds of proposition Lewisian, Russellian, and perhaps some more that we'll come to later, and they can be used for different ends. Our particular interest in prop it propositions, though, is capturing points of view, distinguishing the contents of mental states as part of that larger project of capturing points of view. So from our point of view, we're interested perhaps in Russellian propositions, but not in Lewisian propositions, because we see that Lewisian propositions can't fully capture points of view. Whereas, as far as we've seen, maybe Russellian propositions can. Or perhaps you can already see that we're heading into another problem.